today we have been discovering Oroville. We began at the visitor center and we saw the film. And then we discovered our own capacities to discover Oroville through our excitement with the scooters. <laughs> now you have, have gone off and, and discovered different spaces to sort of bring this discovery to the fulfillment, we've invited Deep T, who is a teacher in Aspiration. The last school. school. Last school. Last school. And I'm sure she'll explain that to us. But she's um, will be speaking about or about the place, its place within India, its place within the world. And uh, welcome. Thank you. Uh, Kesan told me to show you this. All of you have. In front of you, this plant is called Tulsi, and it's uh, a sacred plant. Every house in India would have this plant at the entrance, and it is water. It is connected to Krishna. In fact, the, the dark, this particular plant, I don't know if everyone has it, slightly dark. Uh, this is Krishna Tulsi. So it's, it's a plant that's beloved of Krishna, who is beloved all over India. You know, India has hundreds and hundreds of gods. One of the most favorite of these is Krishna. And Tulsi is a sign of devotion. It is offered in, in temples. And often when you go to a temple, you know, if you come, up, come out of the Christian tradition, you are given, at the end of a Catholic mass, you are given a wafer and wine. Well, in India, you have water and Tulsi is floating in it. And often that water and a piece of tulsi is given you, you take it in your hand, you drink the water, you eat the tulsi, and it's kind of a blessing. Mm -hmm. This flower signifies devotion in terms of offering, in terms of receiving. So this is devotion sitting in front of you. And it's been used since time in India in India as a plant of worship. And it's actually very healthy. It's, um, I think even the, the botanical name uses something about sacred, no? In the botanical name has the term sacred because it is a sacred plant. So, welcome. I believe you just come two days ago and uh, you've seen the movie on Oracle this morning, mm -hmm. that 20-minute movie. Mm -hmm. um, do you all feel you have a sense of Oracle or are there any questions that have arisen? It, it's always good for me to talk to you, which means if I hear what you want to hear, it's better. Other than I do my own spiel and that's not so good. So do people have anything to say, ask about Oregon, about India, about spirituality, about Shogundo and the mother, anything? Is there a question you have that could direct my conversation with you? Yes. Um, the part I found in the movie that was most interesting was the the renouncing of all religions. So you just started your talk with a discussion of the sacred, yeah. uh, which is usually linked to religion. Um, so can you discuss that kind of um, interplay? Okay. So what is religion? Huh? We need to ask ourselves, what is its intention, and in what way is all of them uh, linked or not linked with that intention? Yeah. Okay, I'll bring that in then. Anyone else? Yes. Yeah, I'm interested in you know, how Orville started in the local, of the local mm -hmm. people that I guess were already here and, and how that relationship goes on. Okay. Which you're going to discover as while you're in Orville, this is a question you can ask at every point. Whatever you see in Orville will give you a snapshot of this relationship. But one thing I can say immediately, the people who were here before Orville started are the first mm -hmm. to be here. Mm -hmm. There is no intention of displacement. It's going to have to be a co-evolution, mm -hmm. whatever that means. Mm -hmm. uh, anyone else? Yes. I wanted to understand a little bit more about Orville's presence in the international community as well, from international to national and then locally. So if you could talk a little bit about that specifically mm -hmm. and um, how Orville came to get the attention of international communities might be good. For 
most ancient and the highest in the atmosphere. So, just to answer that point about the sacred and the profane, when you come to a civilizational ethos like India, you, you can't create these separations. Now, those separations exist in our consciousness. When the mind looks at something, it divides. This is sacred, this is not. So, I'm not saying that's not true also. But behind philosophically, the idea is we all partake of that. The other difference from Indian philosophy and other philosophies is because I am already that, I am in an adventure of self-discovery to find that truth. So I am already God, potentially. If you define God, all is God. And each particle in the universe is that Godhead. And I am that already, but I have to become that in actuality, in, in reality, in a knowing. So the truth of life is the truth of being as opposed to the truth of becoming. So what is knowledge in India? It's knowledge that transcends the mental sphere. You cannot know with the mind because the mind is an instrument that divides. And truth is one. So the power of that truth is in arriving at a consciousness where you can contain that oneness in your consciousness. And you can only do that when you arrive at a transcendence of this ratiocinative thinking instrument that we have. You are not a mind. You are a soul <coughs> which has a mind, which has a life, and which has a body. Those are your instruments. So Indian philosophy says you are that, you are in manifestation, and there is a means to arrive at that. And what does that mean? That means for millennia in India, the system, the means was kind of um, studied scientifically, analyzed, and it arrived at a kind of a macadamized roadway. <coughs> Just like if you want to become a physicist, you go to a university and you learn all the laws of physics. You arrive at being a particle physicist, physicist or a nuclear physicist or a solid state physicist, whatever. But you have specialized in that. You could almost say that India has specialized in creating a roadway to self-finding. And the term for that roadway is yoga. The word yoga. And I know you all must be familiar with yoga as asanas. I'm sitting in an asana right now. As are you. If you sit cross-legged, it's called Sukhasana, meaning the pose that brings that happiness. I am sitting in what is called Vajrasana, which is uh, the pose which is um, Vajra is uh, the thunderbolt. So I'm sitting like a thunderbolt. This is called Vajrasana. In fact, the Japanese often sit in Vajrasana. So, Yoga is a means that's been perfected in many different parts of the being. Which means you could do Hatha Yoga, which is what you are mostly familiar with, is a system which perfects the body. It arrives at possibilities and powers through, through immobility and breath. Hatha Yoga's means are breath and immobility. But you can equally do the same sort of thing with your heart, that is through love, through devotion. That's called bhakti yoga. You can do it through will, through action, that's called karma yoga. You can do it through intellect, that's called jnana yoga, knowledge yoga. So there are different yoga systems. These are the means by which you can arrive at a psychological self-perfection. So yoga is a science, but a science of psychological self-development. Accelerated development aimed at union. Yoga is always aimed at union. And union with what? Union with the source of the universe that you already are potentially, but you have to discover in, in manifestation. By harnessing all the latent faculties in your being. So yoga is an accelerated process of self-development. Nature does a yoga in you regardless. You're born and somehow life beats you into some sort of a shape and you arrive at wisdom in time. But you can actually accelerate that process by a conscious self-development and that is what yoga means. 
So yoga is the means, Brahman is the goal. This is what India has to offer. But a means by which you can organize it, you need a kind of a binding process. And in India, we don't have morality, we have dharma. Dharma has nothing to do with society. It's, you look at yourself, what is your nature? What is your capacity? What is your status in life? What are you called upon to do? It's like if I'm called upon to speak to you, my dharma is that I speak as truly, as deeply, as sincerely as I am capable of. Then I'm fulfilling my role. And yours would be to listen attentively, to listen with all your being, to not be distracted. That would be your dharma. So at every moment, there is a dharma that you can find. So these three terms, I've started with India, I was supposed to go to one of them. But these three terms are what India has to offer. So why Oroville and why in India? And how is it universal? Some of the questions you'd ask. So I'm coming to Oroville now. But this kind of gives you, I don't know why I've done that, but it kind of gives you a, a basis for why in India. In a sense, because there is a knowledge here contained for millennia, which Orville must harness, because Orville can't fulfill what it has to do if it doesn't give a conscious yoga of self-development. What we want to do in Orville is to create a conscious collectivity. Now, what does a conscious collectivity mean? We have the only thing that is a binding law for Orville is contained in these four points of the Charter of Orville, which you must have heard in the film. I think the way the film is laid out is somebody is saying the different points of the Charter through those 20 minutes. You have a voiceover that's, that's saying it. So I'm going to say the points of the Charter. Just a little historical background. Orville started in 1968. It was founded by the mother of the Sri Aurobindo Ashram. Um, why did she do that? Because the yoga that Shrivinda and the mother have brought forward is called an integral yoga. So I spoke to you about yoga. Well, if you combine all the yogas that India has, has put forward, practiced through millennia, and you try to synthesize them all, also including all the things that science and the knowledge that science has brought us, if you include that in, because science is a kind of a material yoga too. And scientists who pursue very sincerely this understanding of matter, it's a kind of a yoga. It's not very consciously done, but it is a yoga, because it's a disciplined effort at seeking truth. If you include all that, you arrive at a certain level of integrality. Not yet enough to take you to the future, but to organize you in the present. So Shobindo speaks about an integral yoga. Now, if you look at human history from the beginning of time, we've had people, teachers, who've come and left us a knowledge system which has given birth to all the religions. You have the systems that come under the name of Judaism, which are there in the Jewish Torah. You have um, Jesus, who brings in the New Testament and all his ideas. You have these great teachers. In India, we would call them rishis. We would call them um, guides that come for a particular purpose to get evolution to move on. It's never the last word for us. In India, Jesus would have been included in the pantheon of teachers. So the teachers are called rishis, guides, whether it's Moses or Jesus or Muhammad. You have the Buddha. Now, they have given birth to religions, systems. What is a religion? It's a system based on a teaching, on a particular book, on a particular teacher, on a particular methodology. That's what we define religion to be. What is the aim of religion? To raise yourself from your present state to a higher state, whatever that state is defined. So finally, religion is a God-word endeavor. To that extent, we share with the idea of religion. As long as it's God word, <coughs> what we don't share is the limitation to a particular book, a particular teacher, and a particular methodology. 
In fact, the religion of the future would be when every single human being would find his or her own methodology, own book to guide, own shastra, own guide, and own teacher. Whichever, whichever combination works, if it's a combination of teachers or if it's a single teacher. As long as you don't limit your pursuit to a particular book, a particular teacher, or a particular teaching, it's fine. It's when you limit it and say, this is the truth, you, you end up with the box of religion. In that sense, Oracle doesn't fit, because there is no box you can fit Oracle into. Oracle wants to be as universal as the Aurobindians presently are capable of. So what they have to imagine is Aurobind is everything they imagine it to be, plus every other Aurobindian, plus all those who would come in the future, plus every human being on earth could imagine, plus what they came out to imagine. But as universal as possible. That would be the aim of Aurobind. So nothing is outside the scope of Aurobind. But yes, Aurobind is a god word endeavor. God defined as the source of this manifestation. Whatever. However, God is a kind of a loaded word because it's kind of been co-opted by, by religion. But if you think every particle is God, then it changes perspective. Okay, 1968 Oracle started and why was it essential that a collective experiment was there? Because all these teachers in the past have come. They have been set on a pedestal, the living um, His Holiness is kind of the living Buddha for the Tibetans and we put Mother and Shobindo up also like that as teachers and guides but we tend to settle for worship. We don't make the effort to become. If a teacher is there to give you an example of what you can be and if the teacher just represents a kind of a measure that you have to arrive at in your own development, then the teacher is serving a complete purpose. But if the teacher becomes something that you say, oh, God, manifest, and you are small and human and no more than that and not capable of more than that, there's, kind of, there's something missing in the process. The aim of life is to become the highest you can be. That is spirituality. That is not religion. So teachers have come, they've ended up being put on the pedestal, but it hasn't changed the consciousness of humanity. If you look at some of the things that Socrates said more than 2,500 years ago, actually, in terms of psychological consciousness, humanity has hardly made any progress. We have advanced technologically, but in terms of consciousness, we are as limited. Socrates ended up having to drink hemlock in a democracy. We should remember that he was put to death by a democracy. And if we look at the way the democracies function today, it's not much better, actually, even though it's a good system. It's better than a totalitarian system, but it's certainly not ideal. Whatever the Bush administration may have said, that we've arrived at the fullness of uh, human social organization, we haven't. It's not ideal. So humanity hasn't progressed. Why I'm mentioning Socrates is Plato was a philosopher who actually tried to bring change in society. He had a social system which he created in his philosophical treatise called The Republic. And he actually tried to implement it. In Syracuse, he had one of his disciples who became the, huh? He tried to put in place a democracy with just yes. the yes. elite turning yes. to one else. Exactly. And no one else had any rights. Exactly, that's what I'm saying. So it was a failure before it started. But the poor guy tried. He didn't just philosophize. And he concludes that the problem with philosophy is that they don't have power. So you need a philosopher king. And we're still waiting for philosopher kings. No, we haven't changed human nature particularly since that time. You have Sir Thomas More writing about utopia. And he says it's nowhere because utopia doesn't exist. So literally, it's nowhere. So this dream of a perfect society is very ancient. The Buddha talks about uh, Sangha, meaning a collectivity that is working towards conscious change. So in Buddhism, you have the Buddha, the Dhamma, the Dharma, and the Sangha, the collectivity. So a lot of 
teachers have talked about creating conscious collectivities, but somehow nothing has changed. Even so, if you want to arrive at human change, you need a critical mass. You need a collectivity that would consciously attempt this change. It's not enough that there is a teacher. A teacher can do whatever he or she can do in consciousness, but you need a, a holding body, a collectivity. So from the Bibles, the city of God, you know, the New Jerusalem, to the Buddha's Deva Sangha, to Aurobin, I'm just situating you in a historical context of man's dream of perfection, a perfect society. We are not new in that sense. It is an ancient dream, that a collectivity that would aim at conscious change. So what makes Aurobin interesting? First, what's interesting about Aurobin is the time and place in which it appears. The world has arrived at a point where either humanity changes in consciousness or it's going to be hard. I believe you're all students of sustainability and you're all actively engaged in trying to create sustainability to make the earth comfortable and survive with humanity placed in it. But it's not going to change if you only change it outwardly. The problem of what we are doing on earth is a problem of human consciousness. It's the problem of greed. It's the problem of selfishness. It's the problem of self-aggrandizement. How do you change such qualities in human nature if you do not do a conscious and enabling yoga? Now, Aurora is a place for yoga. But it doesn't put aside secular activities. It is situated in a rural, backward area of a country that's developing, has not arrived at full development. And so you have all the possible problems that humanity could face present in this little, so many hectares that constitute all of it. It's on a human scale. The city is planned for 50,000. And if Orville can succeed, I'm giving you outer arguments, if Orville can succeed in arriving at solutions to the problems that vex humanity on this scale, then it becomes an experiment that's interesting for the world to look at. One of you would ask the question, well, situated in the international context. It is a laboratory experiment, and to that extent it's worth studying. It's not arrived at solutions yet, but the fact is you have to start and try. So just on a social level, it's a sociological experiment in human change. Nothing is excluded. Generally, how do we succeed in life and in, I mean, I'm sure all of you, you're in university and you said, if I want to achieve what I want to achieve, I have to study just this subject. Because you arrive at progress by organized limitation. I'm not going to study just everything because then I'm going to be a jack of all trades and a master of none. I need to master something. So you limit yourself to a particular study and to a particular approach because you think you can arrive at a certain mastery like that. Orville is not given that luxury. Nothing is left out of the scope of the work of Orville. And that's precisely what makes it interesting. What is the work of Orville? Well, just about anything that you can conceive of on every plane that you can conceive is part of the experiment of Orville. So now, with that kind of basic introduction, I will talk about the charter, unless someone has a question. Uh, I'm going all over the place, so it, I'll be happy if you organize me a little bit. But otherwise, I'll go to the charter. Yeah, you're you made a statement that science says that uh, the only things that are real exist. That, that, that appears to be both irrelevant and misleading. So I was okay. you no, what I meant that. was, um, the moment you arrive at abstractions, I'm thinking of people like Richard Dawkins and others who are kind of saying that you know, all that stuff connected to religion has nothing to do with science. Science is the pursuit of the knowable. Yes, it's true that quantum physics has arrived, arrived at the point where you don't even see what you're seeing. Now, you, you, you posit that it's there when we, when we look at uh, 
forks and everything. We are arriving at that point. But science is the pursuit of what you can see, what you can explain, what you can prove. Yes. How do you prove the existence of Godhead? Well, uh, that's a good question. That's why some scientists are trying to prove that God exists. I mean, science just says that they can only measure for what can be observed. Great! As if they don't have an issue with finding that other source, then I am. No, so, uh, that's why some, some scientists are trying to find a way to measure God, prove that God exists. But how would you measure God in that part? Well, oh, that's the question they're trying to answer. It doesn't say that, I'm very uh, interested in that. It doesn't say that they do not believe that God doesn't exist. They cannot prove God does not exist. Okay. Therefore, science cannot say that God does not exist. Agreed. Yes. That's a good scientist, but not all scientists say that. No? No. There is a kind of a polemical argument that's going on, which doesn't happen in India, by the way. Because in India, these are not issues that have been uh, in, uh, <coughs> in opposition to each other. Philosophy and the religious endeavor has never been in opposition to the scientific endeavor. Yes. I think in terms of proving about God, earlier on you mentioned that he is the soul, and so some fringe scientists posit that if they can measure or quantify the soul, then they can prove that God exists. Okay. And so the theory is that if they can create a scale that is so sensitive they can measure in someone's body after they die, there's like a, the theory is that if something leaves the body and there's a, a change in mass of the dead body, that would prove that there is a soul. And that would prove that God exists. Okay, great. So I have no issues with that. Yeah, just a Sorry, so if my statement was very wise, uh, I take it back. Because uh, I don't want to make an issue of that. that, is that it's just that the appearance of statement is it's usually used to say, uh, to just justify throwing science out. It's like science doesn't believe in religion or God, therefore si or science is wrong and it shouldn't be. Used. I was only using it as an argument to prove that at a certain period in time, it was almost necessary to do that, but we moved on from there. Actually, we are not in an age where this argument is that valid. There are a few scientists who are still very strongly arguing uh, in, you know, in that direction. But in general, the world has put it aside, mostly. And then you also talked about a future ideal of universal religion? No, I, I was actually quoting um, Swami Vivekananda. Okay. That was a particular statement that Swami Vivekananda made. And I was saying that ideally, I, we don't need religion as such, but if you wanted to define something that was moving towards a higher truth as religion, then ideally every single individual would have to find his or her own way, which I'm not defining. Okay? Yeah, no, the, I just wanted to say, uh, that balance what you said about uh, uh, that deals for our will. That will also says it rejects, rejects all future religions. Sure. Sure, but then this hardly makes a religion. Religion means everyone has to follow the same pattern. But if everyone has their own pattern, then you call it religion, call it something else. It's just a label. But everyone's individually doing their own thing in some way. And that's it. Let's drop the word. No, the, I actually brought in religion because somebody brought the topic up. Mm -hmm. So I was just placing it into the horrible context. But uh, religions don't really have much to do with what we're trying to do here. But if, for instance, you come here and you, you have a deep feeling for His Holiness the Dalai Lama and what he's doing on earth, you have no problem. You know, people are fans of Michael Jackson when be a fan of His Holiness. It's probably a better uh, being to worship because he has more to teach, perhaps. But no problem, if you're a fan of Michael Jackson, he'll teach you something too. After all, what are you a fan of? That which you look up to. In some ways, we are fans of gods if we if we follow a particular religion. And I'm, I'm, I'm parodying it a little bit, but I'm just trying to say that that which we worship is that which we look up to, that which we... So, okay, you, you look at the sun and say, that's my god. Well, okay, the sun will give you something of its truth, whatever that is. It may blind you also if you look at it too much, but uh, <laughs> whatever. You become that which you worship. Mm -hmm. 
in that sense, I'm saying. Whether you know it or not, that you are modeled on that which you look up to. Well, I'm actually not getting into religion at all, but I'm just saying that it, take it out of this label and you mm -hmm. see what its purpose is for humanity. It has a purpose. But maybe a purpose. Con conservative, backward looking, you know, a kind of a receding into, um, uh, there is this book, American book called uh, The Education of the uh, Little Tree. And he talks about hickory nut spirits when he's teaching this, this um, American Indian uh, teacher who's teaching this little boy and he says, you know, be careful, keep your spirit wide, keep your spirit open because some people reduce themselves into hickory nut spirits. It's a kind of a spirit that's just reduced into itself. So certainly an unending education implies that you are always learning at every moment, from every situation. Unending education, constant progress. You can't learn if you're not in a state of wanting to progress. Progress psychologically, progress intellectually, progress uh, emotionally, progress physically. You have to progress. And if you have this condition in your consciousness of unending education and constant progress, then perhaps you may cherish a youth that never ages. Because youth has nothing to do finally with the number of years you've lived. You can be young at 90 if you're in this state of always enthusiastically learning. And if you meet elderly people who are like that, they're really an inspiration. Because they have, they have all the experience of those years of inhabiting a body, and then on top of that, they, they're childlike in their need to learn. So that's youth, and eternal youth. So the second point of all of this charter squarely tells the psychological nature, this is how you have to be in order. You have to be learning all the time. The third point of all of this charter says, Oracle will be a bridge between the past and the future. Taking advantage of all discoveries from without and from within, Oroville will boldly spring towards future realizations. So you have this idea of a bridge. Why do you need a bridge? You generally need a bridge over, over something that's dividing two spaces. In this case, the past and the future. A bridge implies a connection between the two, so you do not renounce the past but you actually have the energy for the future, a bridge between the past and the future. And what kind of a bridge? A bridge that takes advantage of all discoveries. So spiritual discoveries, scientific discoveries. Science is the field of matter. Spirituality is the field of the spirit, which includes the field of matter, by the way, because spirituality is the whole spectrum. So you have to take advantage of discoveries wherever they take place, within your nature or without. You take advantage of all those discoveries and yet you have the energy to boldly spring towards future realizations. The word realization implies a settled experience in the being. Knowledge is not realization. Realization is embodiment. Realization is manifestation. You can have ideas in the mind. But they have to become forces in your life and manifestations in your body. If you can have an idea that becomes a force and a manifestation, that's realization. So Oracle is about future realizations, not defined, whatever they are, taking advantage of all discoveries. Last point, Oracle will be a site of material and spiritual researches for a living embodiment of an actual human unity. So one of the core aims of all of it is human unity. If you, you know, we've been banding this word around for more than a hundred years. And in some ways, humanity has made great progress in that direction. When you think that the International Postal Union is more than a hundred years old, when you think that the Olympic Games are going to arrive very soon at their centenary, all of these, if you think, if you study the, the, the restarting of the Olympic Games, they become terribly commercialized now. But the aim was, Baron the Kubetan who started these games, the aim was that 
humanity should go higher, should go faster. There was an element of seeking of truth and universal truth, inclusive, not exclusive. Uh, in some ways, all uh, attempts that humanity has made to arrive at universal action. In some ways, you could say that starting with the League of Nations, ending with the United Nations organization, it's a very poor organization. There is a veto power that is held by a few countries. They kind of impose their view on the whole world. That's not ideal, but it's recognized as not being ideal and it's not functioning. Uh, so human unity would imply that everyone would have a voice. Now, on a human scale, we are a few thousand right now, but every voice counts, has equal status. So who's in charge of all of them? The Europeans, whatever that means. Which means a few people come forward and always have more power and have more say and, more, uh, and are more into politics. So everything that you can imagine anywhere in the world is present in all of them. But the only difference is that people have to move on. There is no right to be settled into your position. You're not established. There is a kind of an inflection that, that gets into the situation as it begins and it reverses it. It grows. So hopefully as a society, in our politics, in our governance, in our economics, in our educational structures, these are psychological systems, we tend to go slightly faster than societies all over the world. Tend to go. And I'm not, I'm not saying that for a settled fact, because you could look at Orville and say, my God, these are very uh, you know, anti diluvian things that Orwellians are doing. On the other hand, you can see other things in Orville which are quite impressive, which are way in advance of attitudes around the world. The whole spectrum could be present in the society that is Orville, seeking unity. But everyone has equal voice in that. And it has to be universal, which means no one point of view is the right point of view. So human unity has to be embodied in the body. Orville is, so these are the four points of the chapter. Orville is not an intellectual idea. In fact, most of the Orwellians who are here are almost here in spite of their minds. Because if you, Orville's impossible on the mental level. Your mind would argue a thousand reasons why it can't work. It has always failed in the past. It's, Orwellians are engaged much more on the heart level and on the life level. So what is Orwell? Life growing and perfecting itself. And above all, not in the same way for everyone, each one in their own way. That's a quote, by the way, what I just said. That's the founder of Orwell saying, Orwell is life growing and perfecting itself. So it's not life just as it is. You don't celebrate life as it is. It's pretty hopeless, the world as it is. So you are here because you are dissatisfied with life in the world as it is. You don't even come to Orville if you're satisfied with the world as it is. Orville doesn't have a reason to exist. So you come to Orville because you say, hey, things don't work. Something doesn't work. Now, many people come here for ecological reasons, for sustainability. Then let's try an experiment in eco-village living or let's, let's try to do things better. Let's go for appropriate technology. But in the end, all these are some reasons why you may come here. But finally, finally, the field of work is your own psychological nature. Because in the end, the final pollutant on Earth is your nature, which is not very satisfactory. If you notice that somebody is doing something on Earth that is not very satisfactory, then look a little bit in yourself. And you may find the seed of that problem. Inside. And this is not this mere kalpa kind of thing that you're always saying, oh, I'm so terrible. No, you change. You change yourself. You transcend your limitations. So everyone who comes to Orville is here to do a yoga. Because you're not going to arrive at unity. You're not going to arrive at that bridging of the past and the future. You're not going to arrive at unending education. And you're not going to arrive at willing service until you change your nature. 
So everyone is in order to progress, to grow within. But everyone takes up a work and the work becomes the yoga. Right? So in a sense, when I'm talking to you, it's a work that I'm doing for my own good. If you benefit from it or don't, that's secondary. But I must do what I do for the truth of my own development. You see what I mean? In the end, everything you do is for your own development. So it sounds like a very selfish thing, but actually it's the best thing you can do for changing the earthly environment and making it into a life divine. So the aim of all of it, okay, so I've finished with the charter. Now I can arrive at Shobindo unless you've kind of had enough. We've arrived at, we've got 10 minutes left. So we could also use this time for questions or if you want me to say something about Shobindo's philosophy a little bit more. I, I tell you, everyone, let's take a, a measure. How's it this more about your personal experience instead of where do you situate yourself within all the concepts you're talking about? Well, I'm kind of washing my feet on the banks of this story and I'm very grateful to be there. I think it's a grace. I've been here 36 years. I came here, um, I think, I was a young adult. And I'm endlessly grateful to be part an experiment. It doesn't matter for me to be in all of it or not, but to be part of an experiment in human change, in a collective environment, in a collective, all of it is a collective realization. So for millennia, individuals have done yoga. You can do that in many parts of India, an individual yoga. But a collective realization, which is not limited to one perspective, I don't find any other places at all. And it's frustrating beyond belief for them. Most of the time, it doesn't succeed in being what it should be. By my own standards. But I can't, there is no alternative to doing this with a bunch of Orwellians, which are from already about 45 nationalities. <coughs> and again, it's not a choice who comes here. What is very delightful about Orwell is you land with everybody else. It seems to be chance. You know, we don't, it's not an intentional community in the sense a bunch of people get together and say, okay, we're going to try this experiment, we're going to live together. You said, no, I want to be part of this experiment and you land with everyone else who's part of that experiment. So you've really got to work it out. And there is a kind of an impossibility about that. But that's what's so delightful about it because you are confronting your own difficulty all the time. So I am very happy to be here. Not because you, the satisfaction is in the rhythm of change. And you have to be comfortable with the fact that you're not allowed to be settled. And then, then that's great. And this is a kind of flavor about this place which is interesting. It's different. It's not limited. You will have individuals. It's like the limitations you hear from me are my limitations. You listen to every Aurobillian and you will hear their voice. And it's the sound of all those voices and those that are yet to happen and, and basically also the founding voices of Aurobill that create what is Aurobill because it's open. It's always formed in the moment, in your consciousness, as you hear about it. It's not a fixed system. So that's what's interesting about it, if I made any sense. Yeah? Um, would you define Orville as um, an attempt toward a sustainable community? And maybe, Absolutely. maybe for yourself, define the word sustainable um, for Absolutely. you and how Orvillians de no, no, define Absolutely. it, because... By the way, if I... If I said it's not those things, meaning mm. it's not only those things. Right, right. Absolutely. Yeah. We have to be sustainable mm -hmm. on a material plane too. So we have to do we have to have organic agriculture. Mm -hmm. Why would we continue to perpetuate the errors that have destroyed the earth? Yeah. We have to do better than that. But it seems to me that that human change element is sustain sustainability. Absolutely. Yeah. 
I was kind of trying to say that. Yeah. No, because Charles had told me that's what you all are working on. So I'm kind of pushing this other idea that it's inner change that creates yeah. sustainability. Outwardly, you can keep somersaulting and no. nothing changes finally because you go back to it. One uh, generation changes something and the next generation is back at perpetuating the same things that the first generation rejected. So somehow you've got to change your center of gravity. And it's only possible if you recognize that you are an unlimited soul inhabiting a limited mind, life, and body. That's the key. Because once you recognize that you are not limited, then you can aim at that unlimitation that you are. You can't be something that you're not. Parmenides said that, by the way. He's a Greek philosopher even before. Uh, he says, how can something be which is not? Everything is. So in a sense, people have said this all through the human history. The human history of awakened thought. Because since man awakened to thought, he has dreamed, she has dreamed of a perfect society. But a perfect society is a society created from within out. It can't be outer devices that create that perfection. Whereas those outer devices help you to arrive at something. So everything has a place. But it's not the exclusive. When we give exclusive place to something, we arrive at religiosity actually. 